to the visitors, those of you who are interested in the Department of Public Policy's master's program, Political Analysis and Public Policy. This is being taught by Higher School of Economics Institution, the leading academic space in Russia and post Soviet space. And I would like to uh, explain each one of you the lead component of this program, the idea of public policy in general, why it is so attractive to, to the people in, in cutting across the different disciplines. So we are at some of the basic, let's try to do a bit of a housekeeping information. So we have uh, public policy, which is a part of the political science uh, mega field. And the medium of instruction of a two-year master's program is entirely in English. And we have two tracks, public policy analysis track and human rights and democratic governance track. As you can see, the duration of the study is two years. We start our academic calendar from the 1st of October till the 30th of June in the first year, and the 1st of September to the 30th of June on the second year. As the question can arise, that why it is so that uh, the first year our academic calendar doesn't start from the 31st of September. And the reason is very basic that our program is a very international program, where around 40 to 50% of our all students, and every year we have around 40 students, so approximately 18 to 22 students from that group of uh, freshers are coming from abroad, and they are from distant abroad, from Latin America, United States, Canada, continental Europe, and then there's a visa issue that they do face. So by the time they come, it's already 15th or 20th of September. So we do start a little later. And it coincides with a lot of our partners institutions in Europe who does have their learning space also starting from 1st of October. So why to study public policy? Because it's very interdisciplinary, it's cutting edge. It's unique and innovative program, which has the multidisciplinarity in its uh, research focus space. So it does combine the conceptual and evidence-based learning traditions, both of American and European approach to public policies is incorporated there. The teaching staff has uh, qualification from universities in Russia and from abroad. So you have the, you know, the faculty members who have been from University of Berlin, Switzerland, University of Cambridge, UK, La Trobe University of Australia, and the University of Toronto, Canada. The environment of the program is highly global. Not only are many of our professors educated abroad, and around, as I said earlier, half of the students are international. Professional internships at the network of partner NGOs, think tanks, research organizations, and governmental organizations. So we do have this uh, main principles of the program. So one of that is deep theoretical knowledge in public policy analysis and human rights together with practice-oriented research. So what we try to do is not only the conceptual clarity and the foundation of conceptual understanding of the subjects are being taught, explained, and integrated in your uh, analytical space, but at the same time, in order to make it perfect, we do encourage students during the very second semester of the first year to do a bit of uh, field work, engaging with their research labs, and so on and so forth. So we have practice-oriented research work there too. Uh, so we have the flexibility and diversity of the study, so you have a great variety of elective courses to choose from, diversity of study activities, lectures, seminars, case analysis, group presentations, blog writings, team debates, and role plays. So what we are trying to build among students' uh, learning spaces is that you have a whole range of uh, uh, set of uh, skills that is being ingrained besides the theoretical and conceptual knowledge. The courses are practically taught by the researchers and practitioners with extensive experience around the world. Of course, the course is intense and it's very challenging but quite rewarding because public policy is one of those, uh, the master's program in social sciences which has been very much sought after in, 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 uh, uh, in the global economy. It does demand extensive rating, highly uh, big number of assignments, you have strict deadlines to follow. and. Uh, what we give in return is a set of unique knowledge and experience, both professional and social. Our atmosphere is quite friendly because uh, there is a horizontal space for learning and uh, discussing with your teachers. And you have tolerance and freedom of thought and expression in studies and research. So you're not restricted in your articulation process. 
You don't have to be politically correct um, to, to, to articulate your idea. All that you have to do is that what you argue for has to be uh, smartly uh, formulated, has to be explained in a very um, um, decent manner, so to say. And here we go, the, the uh, faculty members, uh, very basic introduction that I would like to you know, speak about. We have Professor Billy Iver, who is the academic supervisor of the program. And followed by that, you have Dr. Carolyn Schlaufer, uh, Professor Simon Elenko, Dr. Alexander Masakovskaya, Dr. Uh, Durasimova, Dr. Albert, uh, Professor uh, Sergei Barkomenko, yours truly, Sanjay Rajans, then uh, Mr. Dabrowski, Mr. Oldanov, and uh, two of the researchers from Svetlana and Kina, and Ms. Artikova. So practically, each one of them are handling very different niches, different subfields of uh, social sciences. So some of them are quite a big expert in the field of uh, uh, civil society research work. Some people, but what is really common in, in all of them is that they are all very uh, big experts in, in, in the field of public policy and their research work, their publications, and their academic engagement has been uh, quite varied and, in, and, 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 pro, and, and quite rich too. So these are the core curriculum of the course that you can see. You have this introductory course, which are two of them in the first semester. Your foundation of public policy and conflict management. Your compulsory courses, what you call is modern political science, theory and methodology of political research, qualitative and quantitative methods of social research, human rights and globalizing world, global actors in public policy, and this is seminar. The two of that, I mean, the global uh, actors in public policy is in the second year, and research seminar is uh, something that we do all the two years practically to make students write very high quality uh, term paper and master thesis. In the elective courses, you have uh, a range of courses, both on the human rights and democratic governance track, as well as in the policy analysis track. So you have comparative public policy analysis, global political economy, think tank as uh, policy actors, anti-corruption policy and reforms, human rights in non-Western societies, minority rights, freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly and religion, governance, and policy making. So, as we just uh, you know deliberated upon, so you have those two tracks to study concentration, public policy analysis and human rights and democratic governance. Why these two tracks? And the reason is very basic, because we do understand that public policy and the policies made by the policymakers are not a one-way traffic. As much as there is a policy supply side between bureaucrats, politicians, leaders of the country who do implement the policy, there is a likewise demand side of the policy where common citizens, non-governmental organizations, and, and uh, epistemic community, scholars, teachers, professors, they do demand a new policy that helps citizens, that helps the state, that helps the society to function better, more effectively. And that you call more of a demand side of policy. So as we uh, explain that uh, this, these two tracks can be uh, studied in, through two different conceptual spaces. So that's one side, it's called public policy analysis track, and the other side is human rights and democratic governance track. So we have a wide range of careers. So we have uh, students who have graduated out and been working successfully with national, regional, and global think tanks. We have international human rights organizations and other NGOs. We have business associates and large corporations, national, regional, and international government agencies, universities, and academic research institutions. So cutting across the different professional fields that students from social science do go into, so we have a, a fantastic track record, a very good statistic of the students joining different uh, uh, career paths. Some of them have been coming from the Ministry of uh, uh, their respective countries. Uh, we have a beautiful illustrious example of two of the students from Indonesia who were uh, already a bureaucrat, senior bureaucrat, they were mid-career executive. They came back to, to, to take a pause in their career path, came and joined our program, went back, and have been extremely um, grateful to Higher School of Economics for giving them the necessary training, uh, which, which has allowed them to work more efficiently, far efficiently, 
in, in, in their respective places. Uh, so the, here is uh, the guy who I was talking about in the Prasataya. He's working in the Indonesian Coordinating Ministry for Human Development and Pastoral Affairs. And that's not a single case. You have so many cases like him in HSA, in, in public policy program, where the students are already bureaucrats. They are already in career path. And then they are studying simultaneously at times. We have cases like diplomat care. Diplomat has been working uh, in full time in, in his job and at the same time joined our program and got uh, you know, a career growth at the same time while he was uh, um, uh, a student with us. So uh, practically the research and academic proper opportunities, the way we kind of you know, do things in our learning uh, process. So you have the term paper for the first year and master thesis in the last year. As, 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 as a subject, as a thematic that you choose as your final title. And the research project. So you have the participation and policy change in Russia, human rights in post Soviet countries in comparative perspective, human rights production and promotion in crisis situation, civic participation, and social change. Besides that, you have internship in partner organization. We have a huge number of them. You have international research schools on human rights and public policy, international partnership and academic mobility programs, you have different students' projects, that means analytics, research, culture, and education work on public policy issues in Russia, abroad, and at the international level. We do Human Rights Day, International Nonviolence Day, Africa Day, a lot of co curricular activities that practically create a high level of synergy in the learning process and at the same time teach students, those who are following the human rights track, to, to practice the theoretical knowledge. So the clusters of student research have been uh, um, basically engaged in different spaces. So you have uh, um, actor-centric approach, where you are basically analyzing the public policy theories through the methods and methodology. You are checking uh, the process and policies, and you are contesting it with institutions. So that that way you are you are analyzing. So you have the process-centric approach. You have actor-centric approach. You have institution-centric approach. And by that, you're trying to understand the way uh, a policy is being made, the way the policy is being implemented, the way the policy is being collected. And these are some of the examples of the master thesis research work that has been done by the students over years. So you have study scientific groups, civic participation, and social political changes. We have the students who are working together with the professors. Uh, meeting once in two weeks' time, you know, on a one single thematic, which has been researched upon in a very lab kind of social environment, and that results in the formation of a publication. And I would be very happy and proud to say that, and uh, that a similar project like that uh, finally got uh, awarded by 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 the by our higher school of economics with a research grant, and that fun, finally you know resulted into the publication of the book. Um, by the spring of one of the best uh, publication in academia and it's about to be launched in the month of may so that that's that's the beautiful you know how you say um, visible real uh, stuff that that you can be proud about uh internship so these are the places which is not the exhaustive list of uh, our interests but you are here to see some of the institutions where we send our students. So you have government organizations, so you have Moscow City Council, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Besides that, we have two students from Ministry of Agriculture last year, NGOs, and you name it there because there are just two names which came just very handy here. Greenpeace Russia, Memorial. But there's a whole set of non-government organization where the students go for the internship. So you have think tank and research institutions. You have Levada Center, Carnegie, Russian Academy of Sciences, Center for Migration Studies, so on and so forth. And those students who are coming from the media and communication background, we do send them to Nova Gazeta on one side and Russia Today on the other side. So we don't really want to, to create an impression of uh, being, being biased for one side or the other. We do all that we want is that students should have quality knowledge and their internship should be connected with their research topic. And uh, then, then the internship period has been productively, fruitfully, uh, being, being utilized. So these are the other examples that you can see that. You have this MMR, Institute of World Economy and International Relations, Institute of Africa and Russian Academy of Sciences, and there are a lot of labs which are existing inside HSC, international labs. 
So we are getting our students uh, who are having their topics of term paper and master thesis very closely connected with the research thematic of uh, our HSE labs, so the students get their chances there. So we have Ministry of Education and Science, Government of Moscow, Medicine Sans Frontier, Delaware, Russia, US Embassy, Russian Embassy in Kazakhstan, Russian Council on International Relations, so you name it. So this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but uh, a range of uh, in places where students do go for internship. So we have this international research school where students do go to for, for uh, studying thematics and topics which concerns the, our human rights and democratic governance crack. And besides our international winter and spring school that is organized by the public policy department, we do encourage the students to go in different parts of Russia for a one week uh, academic uh, uh, expedition where the professors and the students leave uh, in one single space and they do academic research on the topic that has been chosen prior to, prior to the expedition. So it is one thematic and the students do uh, go for the field trip and write papers together with the, with, with the professors. So you have these international partners that we, we do take great pride to, to announce with. So you have International Political Science Association, the flagship organization worldwide about political studies. You have European Consortium for Political Research, the preeminent institution. You have International Co Comparative Policy Analysis Forum, ICPA Forum. And then you have International Public Policy Association, IPPA. So practically uh, everything and anything that is connected with public policy internationally as an institution, our department has formal and substantial affiliation with that. And besides that, we have international mobility partners. So you have University of Bologna, University of Turin, Sciences Po Lyon, International University College of Turin, Italy, and University of Sarajevo. So these are a whole range of academic institutions with whom we are kind of uh, having massive, uh, massive, and I would say substantial partnership. What I mean by that is that every year we get a lot of students from those institutions who come and study with us, as well as our students going there. So this is just not a formal agreement or formal academic mobility, but it's very substantial. And so, also, so similarly, we have the teachers going there back and forth. So for the Russian applicants. A portfolio and face-to-face -face interview starts from 20th of June when you can submit your portfolio and it ends 31st of July. Interview is in the very first week of August. For the international applicants, portfolio and online interviews application is, is a very rolling over. It's a very rolling uh, admission process. It starts from 15th of October. Uh, last year it started and it will go on till the end of August 20th of August to be very precise. You have the state scholarship which is full tuition waiver and usually awarded earlier between March to May window. And you have HSC partial scholarship that is available till August when the students are smart and we do consider that they, if at all, can't pay the full fee, so we do provide them a certain discount. So you have, uh, you know, what is, what is to be submitted here in your portfolio, you have to have your motivation letter, CV, you have to have your bachelor's and master's degree. If at all you have a diploma, it should be added with the transcript. You have the winning of participating in Olympiads, different certificates of your achievements that are quite handy, that are quite useful. You have, if at all you have got grants in scientific research or getting individual scholarship, that would be very fantastic to add on. You have academic or professional writing in your bachelor's and master's thesis. If at all you've already done one master, that would be interesting to see what you have submitted for your master thesis. And of course, it's quite, um, quite, a, quite expected that you would have your letter of recommendation from your previous academic supervisor, your research consultant, your employees, if all you're full-time working somewhere, and, and uh, your, your uh, people in uh, of acquaintances, but in from the academic space. So you do have, what you have is a student chamber. That means that students are quite active. They are organizing their events. They are kind of leading their shows, which are going concurrently with the learning process where they are organizing some of the strong thematics. So last um, uh, December, the Students' Chamber of the Public Policy Department did organize uh, a pan HSC um, a Human Rights Week. And uh, it was uh, a great pride for us 
that it was unprecedented in the, in the entire history of high school economics that a whole week was on human rights was commemorated um, under the 70th year declaration of uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, and last year, 2018, was the 70th year. And our students took great pride in organizing a series of workshops and, and conferences, roundtables on, on the subject. And besides that, what the students do, they are constant feedback providers to us in our entire learning process, what's not going well, what has to be corrected, what has to be changed, what has to be adapted that enhances the whole learning process. And besides that, if at all there are some social problems that might emerge uh, for any one of the students, so the student chamber does take care of that and do provide us uh, uh, immediate information so that the department can reach out and help the students in need. So these are the things that we do in the learning process. The students are practically doing presentation, a lot of uh, uh, group work that uh, demands uh, a theme that has to be presented as a collective, as a group. And this is an icebreaker where the students work together and, and bring their presentation together. They know how to respect the time limit. They don't really kind of uh, uh, you know, go very bombastic. So they try to kind of uh, work together with, with, as, as one collective. And that, that's quite useful, I would say that. That's really, really useful. So you have simulation games. So you, one of that was uh, uh, done along with the professors. When a topic, supposing for that matter, you have environmental policy in Malaysia. So we see that if a policy is being formulated, so there are a lot of stakeholders in a policy that has to be passed. So you have on the one side pressure group, which is called oil lobby. Pressure group was again one is an environmental lobby. Then you have government side, which you mean uh, the prime minister. Then you have the bureaucrats who are full time engaged, uh, pushing and formulating the papers. Then you have think tank thinkers, scholars, experts, who, and they might be in two different sides. You can be conservative, and you have think tanks that are liberal. And then you have external actor groups, so you can have uh, a multilateral. Uh, organization for that matter, UNDP, and they can have their own issues uh, the, the way the environment of the country has to be preserved. And the students who work in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way to, to uh, as, as a group, to articulate their position, their demands, the way before a policy is, is, is coming as a law. So that, that's very interesting. So you have a very holistic understanding about why the policy is being made and shaped up. So besides that, students do continue to participate uh, in writing of the blogs, where they do discuss about uh, the different uh, um, issues uh, related with human rights and social justice, and they write their blogs, and basically these blogs are graded. So as, as you can see in example, you have conflict management exam, students are working together, they're working as a team, they are kind of building up their, their partners and, and, and then trying to understand the way an issue has to be, has to be analyzed and, and understood. So this is a part of the role play that the students do. So you might see that the students have uh, uh, taken up an issue which is related with uh, human rights, like Guantanamo Bay's, um, you know, uh, prisoners, and the students did a role play. Basically, that enhances, qualifies, uh, and and uh, supports the entire idea of, uh, of what human rights learning is. In theory, you practically practice it in order to keep those ideas and ideals stronger, intact inside you. And similarly, you have this Human Rights uh, Day that is being celebrated uh, in, by, by the student chamber. So these are the whole thing that was organized, workshop one, workshop two, which is really the ethnic discrimination and minority rights, disability rights, sexual minorities and homophobia, freedom of thought. And uh, the leading, leading civil society organizations of Russia has been the facilitator and moderator for such events. So that can be very interesting to see that we are getting our students connected with the leading uh, uh, employers and, and uh, international organizations 
where they can see their future internship, their future job, and at the same time to understand in what way a certain theoretical knowledge and idea is being practiced in, in real life. And besides that, these are some of those you know, social pictures that you can witness. It is very interesting to observe and understand the, the students collective, the group, where the students are practically joining the team together, trying to build up a, a, a group work and, and uh, further enhance their, their knowledge space in, 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 in practice as much as in theory. So these are some of the pictures of this Human Rights Day, as you can see that. This has been uh, the set of people who have come here and celebrating, organizing, discussing the issues and agendas. Yeah, but they, at the same time, there's, there's a chunk of socialization process that goes on with the students. And you can see the way the students are kind of you know, um, converging together, trying to chill out together, and to, 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 to grow uh, uh, their, their learning space, both in the formal learning environment as well as in the informal learning environment, where they, they're, there's an internationalization of the learning process is being practiced in two sense. So these are the happy pictures in the cold winter of Russia, where you are you know, celebrating the the, the, the upcoming new year, the students and the teachers do celebrate the, the arrival of uh, Did Moroz and Santa Claus, and uh, people do provide the gifts to each other, celebrate the good time together, and yes, this, this is practically after the, um, the end of the first semester's exam, the last days of December, when the students are coming to celebrate with the teachers and to go for a holiday just for the new year vacations. So that's practically all about us. We are uh, extremely uh, proud and privileged to teach uh, the students from different continents of the world. The one continent that misses is Antarctica so far. We got students practically from everywhere, and our, our department uh, takes great pride in having uh, uh, students who are coming from very diverse academic background. We have students who have already achieved two masters and they joined our program. We've got students who have been pursuing a parallel PhD somewhere else and has joined our program to study public policy. We have got fresh graduates who have been joining our program. And uh, we are quite active in the sense of uh, doing a lot of things uh, besides uh, research and publication, which are connected with our students' initiative. We do promote and support students' initiative, their own creative urge to blossom. So that's all from my side. I'll be happy and open to the question that you have uh, uh, you have uh, from your side. Uh, the question that comes from, can I take the questions now? Yeah. All right. So one question that comes from S. Avokadze, uh, as, as, as I can understand right, are there any adaptational courses for those who completed their bachelor's degree in other fields not in political science? Of course. I mean, I would say that uh, in your case, we don't have a 40 plus students who are all from the political science background. It's practically 50% of the students who have political science or IR background, but the rest of them are coming from the diverse academic spaces, be it sociology, be it media study, sometimes from humanities or linguistics. And that's why we have two courses. One is Foundation for Public Policy, and the other one is um, Conflict Studies and Mediation. So these are the two courses which are foundation courses where there's a lot of group work, there's a lot of basic reading, and a kind of an adaptation environment where you are kind of building up uh, uh, the coherence, uh, a certain kind of rhythm with the rest of the group. So that's, that's quite easy. And uh, in, in your case, Mr. Avocadze, I would say by having uh, the background of sociology is an asset because we do a lot of uh, methodological research work, which does uh, help if at all you have a sociology that's in your background. So I'm open here for the question, if at all you have a uh, question. Maria, if at all you have any other question, uh, as I can see, uh, Maria is around, and then Falikao is uh, around. Can you just introduce yourself with your questions? That would be very kind. And in the case of Mr. Avocado, if you don't have any other question, please go ahead.
Yeah, there is one question as I guess. Is that difficult to combine study with work? At what time do courses usually start? You see, we are not teaching in the first half of the day. So it's not from 9 o'clock. Our first semester do have classes from 3 to 6. And then you have classes from 6 to 9 most of the time, starting from the second semester. So what I would encourage you to, to understand that HSC has around 50% of the students who are working at the same time. It doesn't really hurt them because they are having intensive academic uh, uh, learning process that goes on where the students make a good fit with their job. So yeah, we, we have classes from three in, in, in the first semester, but from there on, from the second semester, you have most of the classes from six. Yeah. Any other question? Polikao, are you around with me? Or Maria, do you have any question? It looks like that we are done with that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. See you in the class. Probably you will be joining us.